Hello and welcome to Dragons. Oh, and oh, look at that. Don't talk yet. Oh, my. So, uh, Dragons, <laughs> Unicorns, and Other Creative Creatures. I am here with the currently lipped busy Rona Goffstein. I'm getting there. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Kevin. Unicorns, Dragons, and Other Creative Creatures is a show that we have come together to do to support local art and artists of all kind. So I have a unique beginning to the show today yes. because I wanted to make this kind of like a Mother's Day show in a way. Um, and so we decided we have an artist on who's a mother of some kind. We haven't figured out what kind. Um, but uh, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get today's <laughs> guest. <laughs> guest. Uh, I'm not going there <laughs> yet. Uh, yet. Bad story. Maybe I should spike the coffee. Then I could go there. And then, there you go. You didn't spike the coffee? Not, What's wrong with you? Uh, you see, everybody thinks that this is, I, I just put water in this water bottle, which obviously was to match my oh, outfit lovely. and to match your outfit. I know. But, um, and to match your hair. Can you see the purple? See, she's got purple in her I do, hair. I do. Is that a, a, a purple people eater? It's a, no, because then I'd have only one eye and one horn, and I'd fly, so I'm not a purple people eater. Well, I've seen you fly before. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, different kind of flight. Um, <laughs> Apparently what happens in Vegas does not necessarily stay in Vegas. Hey, I didn't go into details. <laughs> Thank goodness. This is a family show. Now, um, so uh, Mother's Day is right around the corner. It is. This is our Mother's Day show again. And what I realized is, and I threw this together very last minute, so I apologize to, to you and our guest today because I was like, we gotta do something for Mother's Day. And what I discovered was I had written three different poems to my mother in three different periods of my history. And I'm gonna quite, kinda sorta quickly, but I'm gonna read them. All right. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the role of mothers and creativity. Uh, and you are a mother of a creative. A mother of two creatives. You're, you're a mother of two creatives, and you're a creative mother. I am. And we're going to talk about the pros and cons of that. Um, I am one creative mother. <laughs> uh, and that can be said about our guest. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And probably has been. Yeah. Um, so the first one, mother. Slowly I come to discover you as if seeing you for the very first time. You step off a pedestal made of love and hate to become human. I see you now for both your frailties and your strengths. I see you now as a person, a person with whom I have spent my whole life with and yet never looked at as a person, a warm-hearted woman with insecurities and unsureties of 50 years, special in her own way, is my mother. And I wrote that in 1986, because she was 50, and I was 26. And so that's how I saw my mother at 26. I wrote this one in 2013. Okay, so a fair amount of time had passed. Fair amount of time had passed, and the relationship had definitely changed. Mm. Mother, I chose to be born of you, to come from you, to be part of you. We've not always seen eye to eye, we have not always had the relationship we wanted, but we've always loved, we've always been there. We've shared deaths and births, been there for the best and worst of times. We've been each other's teacher and student. In anger, hurt, doubt, pain, and joy, our relationship has survived. Not as a holiday relationship where we smile, telling each other only what we want to hear. You have not always liked what I have had to say, but never once stopped loving me. I have not always liked what you had to say, but never once stopped loving you. I choose you to be born of you, to come from you, to be part of you. I choose well. Definitely some different energies from yes. the first. And then, I wrote this one this morning when I decided to Mother's Day. Freshly squeezed poetry. Freshly squeezed poetry. I decided to Mother's Day, and I'm like, okay. So the, the other one was 2013. So this is only four years later. Yep. Struggling, I watch you fight for what you have left when so much is behind you. You have married husbands, 
buried children gone from being codependent to fighting every day to stay independent. Maybe you can't dance like you used to, but you still dance. I respect no matter how difficult you still dance. You forgot more, you forget more, and may ask more than once, but you still ask, you still want to know. You want to help, you want help, but you refuse to be a burden. You want connection with what's left of your family, but refuse to come home. You have decided to die there, living with the same man for almost 50 years. You will do it on your own terms, as in your own way you always have. Perhaps I am more like you than I thought, for I suspect my choices would be the same. So those are my three tribute poems to my mother. It's interesting. It's interesting, especially the first one, because um, you wrote that for her when she was the same age I am now. So it's interesting to think about a son looking at his mother at that age. And, and I was a little older than both of your sons. Yes, you were. Yeah, because I had my children later. Yeah. But that was the age when I said, my mother is more than a mother. My mother is a person. Yes. There's a person here. Yes. And that is a person who I'm not always, I'm going to love, but I'm not always going to like. Yeah. And, we're, and, and we have our struggles. It's not a requirement. No. To so. like some, I mean, it's hard to like someone. I don't even like myself all the time. So um, I'm going to bring into our conversation um, our today's guest. Oh, good. Who um, I actually invited to be today's guest before I decided at the last minute to throw everybody a curve and do a Mother's Day Whee! show. Here comes one from Woo! left field. <laughs> I like to know that we're flexible. Uh, we just absolutely. switched the yin and the yang side of the dragon and the unicorn's laughing. Uh, <laughs> we're welcoming Matt Connerton. Matt has been a regular, uh, has been on Web of Light a couple of times. We did a sp show special and then you came on again. Mm -hmm. um, is she, Matt is the founder of IPM Nation, uh, which has both now got a radio component and a TV component, both on the internet. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matt is a is a uber creative of his own. Mm. Um, you know Matt only by phone and voice. By phone and voice and face, not in actual physical form. Right. This because is we've our we've spoken on the phone, meeting, yes. we've skyped, and I've seen you on Facebook. Yes, indeed. Yes. So this is the first time he's actually I've, I've had him manifest in in on this plane in this physical form. <laughs> Speaking of the phone, by the way, I also have purple. Oh, You're good. Purple, purple oh, uh, phone cover. Yay. Which I purchased a little over a year ago after the passing of Prince. Oh, okay. true story. I true like story. That. Yes. There you go. Hey. Yes. Well, and that one hit me. Yeah, me too. Matt and and Rona were uh, actually came to cross each other's path because they both worked on Dr. Kevin Radio Network. We did. That's right. Um, before it got uh, absorbed, before other sold programs to, and yes, to Om Times, which holds holds my show now. My yes. radio show. Yes. So um, I wanted to have us all onto this conversation. Um, I do want to, Matt to share some of the ways his creativity plays out, but I'm sure we're going to have Matt on again at some point. Okay. That's always pretty good about coming and showing off his face when I ask. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I shaved and everything. Wow. Uh, yes. See, more impressive. than just one a mother could love. Okay, there you go. So talking <laughs> about mother love, um, you know, um, I, I read the poems, and I'm going to weigh in on my mother last because I read the poems. I want to pass it around for a few minutes, so I'm not doing all the talking. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, how is your mother with your creativity, and how are you a different mother with your children's creativity? Um, I think I was pretty, I know I was pretty fortunate. Both my mother and my father were not one of those people who went, oh my God, you want to be creative, you're going to starve to death here, become a teacher, become a lawyer or anything like that. I grew up in New Jersey, um, about 25 miles or so from Manhattan, and theater, as I've said, was my first love. So um, my parents actually took me to, not only to the theater, but to let me go to theater camps. And my father actually took me out of school one day to go to an audition. So they were always pretty open about, and be, you know, supportive of the idea that maybe I wanted to be a creative uh, or pursue something creative. Um, then I went to college and majored in economics and philosophy, and that didn't seem particularly creative. Um, but 
Definitely, <laughs> she's definitely two majors, no answers. Um. I was going to say, I think I, I think economics is very creative. <laughs> The way they come up with some of the things that they put oh out about the economy. Gosh. There's many different yeah. economic theories, yeah. Yes. Yes. I, highly creative, what but there was, it, go ahead. What was it, was it um, who was it, uh, Harry Truman who wanted a one-handed economist? Because oh. they kept saying, well, on the other hand. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, 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 I'm done with this. Um, so I didn't, I didn't choose to actually live any of my creativity until um, a little over 10 years ago now. <coughs> Um, actively, but the arts, the museums, the theater have always been a part of my life. Um, and it definitely wasn't something that, you know, other people went into and not our family and things like that. So I'm um, very fortunate with that. Um, for my kids, as I said, I've been, um, I've been published. It'll be 10 years this summer, actually. Congratulations. It's kind of amazing. And um, what... <sighs> One of the things I had been reading once um, on creativity was Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Love it. And yeah, every, every couple of years I take another journey through it. And of course you discover new things. And they talk about the, the noises parents make, you know, that sort of shadow us and stuff. And I didn't feel that. But one of the things I saw in one of the quotes down the side was something that said, uh, there's nothing worse for a child than a parent with an unrealized dream. <coughs> and at the time I had been, um, telling people and sharing that I wanted to be a writer, but really hadn't done much about it. And um, <coughs> my kids were very young at the time. I thought, you know what? My life will be better, their life will be better, and everything will be easier in many ways if they only know me as a published writer. So I made a commitment to myself uh, to finally finish something polished enough and submit it by my 40th birthday. I missed that by two months. Uh, but then it was published um, <coughs> by an independent uh, publisher eight months later. So, you know, my oldest is now 17, my youngest is 14. They've almost always known me. Most of their memories include me as a published working creative. Um, and they've always known that they, they had the support now to do that. We've had Max on the show. We have, yes. Um, and he's shared his creativity. Now, how does Ethan's creativity play out? Ethan's creativity plays out in a couple different ways. First, in the kitchen. Um, he's actually a really good cook. He's a better cook than I am. That wouldn't necessarily take much, but he's definitely a better cook than I am. Um, he, uh, he loves doing, so he will watch shows. I mean, he's been known to, to watch, you know, a, a series of shows on the Food Network and then start creating rubs in the kitchen out of whatever spices he can pull out of the, mm. the cabinets and things like that. He's also an entrepreneur, which has been very creative for him in choosing what, he's a thrift, <coughs> an online um, thrift resale business, so in choosing what clothes, to sell, what sneakers to sell, how to present them, how to photograph them, um, how to write the descriptions that will get them noticed um, and make the sales. And when I left, he literally had a pile of boxes this high that had to go out. I think he had seven different purchases from last week that needed to be mailed mm. out. So that's Excellent. been a very creative Good. place for him and a very big focus. Matt, share some of the places. I mean, we know that you are a radio show host, a talk show host, a TV talk show host, you, I mean, and those are actually very creative roles, mm -hmm. but share some of the creativities that people aren't necessarily aware of how you're created. How, oh, that's a broad question. <laughs> I should have let her ask it then. <laughs> oh, I, I am a broad. I, I see what you did there. You did, isn't that good? See, the coffee's all kicked in then. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I am a hypnotherapist, and my mother actually uh, hypnotized me a couple of times when I was a kid, which kind of piqued my interest in it, but years later, I went back to it. It's funny, usually when I talk about my mother, because I'll, I'll mention, I've mentioned my mother on my, my show, but it's usually when I talk about her, it's in the context of uh, many, many years ago, I went to a psychiatrist, and uh, my experience with the psychiatrist was exactly what the classic sort of cliche is. <laughs> so We're, tell me about your mother. Right, I had to lie. Yeah, literally. It's, I, old, I, it's not one thing, it's my mother. I had to lie on a couch and talk about my mother for oh, an hour, and I never gosh. went back. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but she was always very supportive of all my creative endeavors and whatnot, even though we, we live in different parts of the country. But, uh, but she was always one to really encourage me to do whatever it was that drove me. Um, and never discouraged me from anything. Now, you, uh, when you do 
your hypnotherapy, you do you do stock um, hypno suggestions, or do you create your own? Oh, I'm very creative with that. Yeah, that's a great question because. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, gee. Oh, no, the because. Well, I'll tell you, when, uh, when I first started, um, I went through the, the National Guild of Hypnotists, and, and they give you these scripts to read. Mm -hmm. You know, like they'll give you a stop smoking script and a weight loss script and a, a stress reduction script and whatnot. And I would use them in the beginning uh, when I first started doing private sessions, uh, which, you know, is fine, and there's nothing wrong with using them. And I'm very good at reading aloud. So I could read them as though I was just you know, saying the stuff. It didn't sound like I was reading from a paper. But now, today, of course, I, I don't read anything from a script. I just, you know, when I sit down with the, the client and they tell me whatever it is, usually a series of things. Mm -hmm. They might come to me for one thing and I'll say, well, what else do you want to work on while you're here? So I'll have a series of things to work with. And I, I get pretty creative with the, uh, with the hypnotic suggestions that I give them during a session. I'll bet what they originally come in for is only a tip of the iceberg. I mean, what you, yeah. think, what you think you need and what you actually need or want sometimes is... Yeah, and there's usually more stuff related to it. You know, if they're coming to me for quitting smoking, which is what I do by far the most of, you know, then we'll also tackle, well, what are the things that cause you to smoke? What are the things that right. are stressing you out, et cetera? So, yeah. And how maybe not to gain weight after you quit smoking. Right. That's a big one. Yep. Because yeah. I was on Matt's show and he demonstrated hypnosis by doing hypnosis on me. I never had it done. Um, and I what? listened to that for months afterwards. I Good. taped it and I listened to it for mm -hmm. months afterwards. And then at some point my life shifted and I stopped listening to it. Because um, I've, I've told you I'm going to come back. I'm, I'm going to come back on your show at some point just so you can do the next set of hypnosis, you know. Yeah, yeah. That way I don't have to pay for it. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> Professional uh, courtesies. Um, but... Uh, so I, so I knew, I, it was kind of a setup question because I knew that you were creative because yeah. you took the stuff on the air and let's talk about pressure here. Here you are on oh, the yeah. air live and somebody's throwing stuff at you and you have no idea. None of that was pre-rehearsed. Right, right. With no idea. And he's just like immediately like, okay, mm -hmm, yep, I'll get Boom. Do, 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 do. Yeah. And I was like, mm, that's impressive. <laughs> ten, ten years ago when I started, I wouldn't have been able to do that. No, you'd freeze up probably. Or... Yeah, yeah. So, but you also have some music creativity, do you not? I've been in quite a few bands. I've written a lot of songs. I play bass. Oh. I've done some production. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when he just kind of, he just kind of. Couple of bands. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I've written a few <laughs> songs and like, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> um, so first of all, um, what, so do you play what, bass? I play bass. A little bit of guitar, but bass is what I'm okay. sort of good at. And what kind of genre uh, have the songs been? I've played in a lot of different kinds of bands. I've played in some hard rock bands, some metal. I was in a band called Chemical Distance, which was kind of experimental, a mix of like hip hop and electronica and very, very mm. difficult to categorize or, or describe. Um, that was a creative project. I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. Now, what was... <clears throat> um, now, are you doing any band work now, these days? No. Um, I, I miss it, but I'm so busy. No. It's you have to just, choose. Yeah, yeah. So with the band work, uh, so songs, what different genres have you written songs in? And like, give me an idea of how many, you know, I mean, like, have you written two or three? Have you written 20 or 30? Oh, I've... 1,500? Certainly more than 20 or 30, but I couldn't put a number on it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, tend to be in the same genre. Yeah, I mean, genres. just it's your basic rock songs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, like in Chemical Distance, the really creative, unique band I was in, I didn't do any of the writing in that. I just played bass. But I can write your standard three chord rock song. Yeah. I thought it was four chords. <laughs> three verses and a chorus. I thought that you depends. needed four. Yeah, the four chord. Some of the bands I played in, we'd use four chords. Sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the four chord success. There's a great video. There's a, <laughs> have you seen that video? There's a group called Access of Awesome. And they're like, why have we never had a hit? And he's like, well, we've never, we haven't recorded our four, our four chord hit. I was like, what do you mean four chord hit? And he plays the four chords of Don't Stop Believing. And then he keeps playing the same chords. And they go through like oh. 40 songs. Yes, yes, yes. I know what you're talking it's about It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. They've all got the same. Yeah. Going all the way back. And because they're Australian, they even use Waltzing Matilda. 
Wow. I think, or one of those, you know, it's, it's really amazing how similar it all is. And now, yeah. now that you, and once you hear that, you can keep hearing it over and over again. In like every song yeah. comes on the radio, you're like, oh, it's that oh, four yeah. chord song. Oh yeah, four chord song. So, um, now your mother lives in the Midwest. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, does she ever get to see any of your TV shows, listen to your radio shows? Has she ever seen you in a band? Ah, uh, she's never seen me in a band. I mean, <gasps> everything else I do is online, That's so she has access to it, do. but she's never seen me play live. Does she ever give you feedback on your online stuff? Do you know whether she, whether she actually... The only thing she's ever given me for feedback is compliments, but if she's my mom, <laughs> what else would she say? Unless she were a bad mother and said something mean. <laughs> And then I wouldn't call her on Mother's Day if she did that, because I'd be like, what a bad mother. She's mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will not tolerate a mean mother. <laughs> oh, mean mother. Got it. She's I told mother. her that, too. <laughs> well, you know, uh, as I did this mother, you know, I read the, the different poems. Obviously, mm. it was kind of clear. My mother and I have struggled occasionally along yep. the way. My yep. too. Um, and I, you know, and... I have a couple of uh, mother, quote unquote, mother stories. And I want to say this. I do love my mother. I, I, for a long time, everybody compared me to my father, that I was very much like my father, Same Papa, yeah. that I always talked about. Your parents are both still alive, correct? Papa had, no, Papa passed in 2007. He did, okay. Yeah. My mother and stepfather are together. And gotcha, they, okay. And they've been together for like 48 years now. Okay. So, you know. They're in Florida, right? Yep, they're in Florida. Okay. That's where she's choosing to die, mm. um, uh, as far as I can tell. And I don't say that with any, like, judgment or issue. It's right. just, you know, No, that's right. her choice. That's her choice. Yeah. Um, and I do think that it's, that it's really hard for adult children sometimes when they have to not agree with a choice and they know that their parent may not be as with it as they used to be mm -hmm. or as on the ball as they used to be. I mean, that's a struggle there. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, which is part of the struggle here where, you know, I, I, I went from, you know, when she was 50, struggling with her to at, you know, now she's in her 80s, I watch her struggle. Yeah. yeah that's and, a big change. And, and seeing that thing. but. My, my mother, um, interestingly enough, because like even that first poem I read, it was like, you know, I see her for her frailties and her insecurities and things like that. So like when I wrote that poem for her and read it to her, she was a little less than pleased. Really? Oh. Well, <laughs> she was still at the stage where she wanted to be seen as perfect? Well, it wasn't that she wanted to be seen as perfect, but I don't think that she actually wanted uh, her her child to say that she had frailties and insecurities right. and she was really human, uh, you know, like that. And, and you know, so I, and I realized that. And back when I was, you know, in my 20s, as we all, do, or most people do in their 20s, you're still in that a little bit of like it's all about me stage. Oh, yeah. Where you're kind of like, because I wrote this, wrote this poem and I'm like, you know, what mother wouldn't be pleased if a child wrote her a poem? Wrote a child right. poem about that would be a great thing. Right. But I would keep on talking to people in the family and friends, and they'd be, "Oh, you wrote your mother a poem? She didn't say anything. She didn't say anything. She didn't say anything." Well, that's because she didn't like what I said about her. Right. Right. <laughs> and and so I took it as kind of, okay, there's a mixed message from my mother about my poetry, but that never stopped me from writing it. Yeah. Um, because when I was. 19, my brother got killed, oh. and I had written, she had me write every year on the anniversary of her death for about five years, she'd asked me to write a new poem for him that she would publish in the paper. And oh, after wow. like five years, I was like, I can't keep doing this, because really? it's like I have to relive. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. trauma. You know, five years have passed, where yeah. would you be now? And I was like, I, I can't. So she was always about the poetry that was not about her. But how did she react when you told her you couldn't keep doing that? Um, she had an interesting, she was kind of like, I, she kind of understood and she's like, you yeah. know, I don't want to push you and stuff like that. And she just backed away. She didn't, oh, that's good. She didn't give me a hard time. Yeah. Um, at all. And as, and she was always interested 
she was always semi interested because poetry was not her thing. She wasn't a poet fan. Right. So that's always hard, that and that's hard difference. for a mother if yeah. you if you're not into poetry. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, my older son, in addition to the creative stuff, is a phenomenal baseball player, and and he'll explain things and he'll do things like, "Is this okay? Are you interested?" I'm like, "It is fascinating to me that you are this passionate about it, but if you think I understand all of it." maybe right. you're gonna have to repeat a few things at some point yeah so yeah it's just it's who we are we're, we're, we are I mean I think it's one of the things you brought out in the poem is there comes a point where you realize how a separate how separate a person you are from your mother and your parents and and all of that that upbringing yeah um, and it's interesting you know, she may not have liked the poem but you know I I heard you read it and as as a mother I heard the child. I mean, I didn't. I yes, I see the mother's perspective because I kind of can't help it. But what I saw and heard in that poem was not about her, but about you. How your relationship with her was evolving as your relationship with yourself evolves. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and we have to. There are adjustments to to be made. You know, one of the things I do is I mentor poets. Yeah. Uh, and I've mentored a few poets through the years and helped them bring a book to completion or mm -hmm. whatever. And there's always this thing out there of, do you go back and change something you wrote five years ago or 10 years well, ago? Well, that's funny because I just rewrote, a, I'm rewriting a book to be published this summer that I wrote. <laughs> it was published five years ago. So, yes, <laughs> on some levels. Well, you know, on a novel that's different, that's fiction. I think in nonfiction, no, I think there's something special about what it was and where it was. Which is why I won't change poems. Yeah. I might go back and rewrite a book. Yeah. yeah. That would be a different thing. But a poem is a marker in time. It would be like, I mean, you and you write songs, which is also has a poetic aspect to it as far as, you know, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I've seen song lyrics that when you take away the music could easily be read as Right, as it's, it's, a, it's a poem when, when there's no music, yeah. 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 And, and, I mean, have you gone back and changed songs or thought to? Or? Yeah. I, I, I think in terms of uh, how musicians view songs, I think it is a little bit different mm -hmm. because musicians okay. rewrite songs all the time. That's interesting. Oh, uh, we got to make this more commercial, so it'll be a hit or whatever. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> we got to sell out. <laughs> that's, not, that's not unusual. Gotta, so I think no, it is I'm a little different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it depends on who you're writing for. Like, yeah. I've, I, yeah. I, I write songs, and I've never tried to get a song, like, accepted anywhere, or I've never tried to, like, produce it out or things like this. Um, driving Force, I mean, I did, I did, was actually asked to write a song for a, for a Broadway show and I wrote it and then the show didn't end up happening but I wrote a specific song with a which is really weird because I'm not really a songwriter but you know that that but it was part of an extension of a conversation right and so I kind of wrote the song and they wanted they were going to use it and then the show just didn't happen huh. um, but uh, so it's it's kind of bizarre there but I might more likely rewrite a song depending on if I was trying to make it fit into something. Right. Yeah. If I was right. going to take one of my songs and say that would be a perfect song for like a script I was writing and I wanted that song to be in there. Okay, yeah. I might then change it to reflect the movie mm -hmm. versus where I was in that point. Right, because then it's not for you anymore. Yep. And it's not there to express something you were feeling, it's there to express something a character is feeling or whatever, and that's a little, then it moves into fiction almost. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, well, and then you go back. Who are you writing for? Right. Are you, if you're right. writing for an audience, you adjust for the audience. Yeah, to an extent. I yeah. never, I, I rarely ever write poetry for an audience. Yeah. I always right. write poetry for myself. And it shows in the fact that you've had three different poems from different times. I mean, why go back and readjust something? Why not take the time to experience it again and from this new perspective? I mean, that's a gift to yourself and potentially to the person who reads it, but definitely to yourself. Yep. You know, how have I changed? How has life changed? How is my, the old uh, Mark Twain quote, you know, when I was, is it when I was 21 or 14, I thought my father was an idiot and when I was 28, I couldn't believe how much the old man had learned in right. seven years. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and then we get to, to see some of that and you get to, you, know, you as the writer get to experience some of that and then we as the reader get to experience it as well. Well, you know, one of the things that people don't always get about parents, and when we get closer to Father's Day, I've written a t I wrote a ton of poetry for my father versus the, the, 
the three markers from my mother, which again is an interesting comment on the oh. relationship. Yeah. Um, but um, when my first book came out, and it was a very woo-woo metaphysical book, and it was right out there, and it was cutting edge, and it was pushing envelopes. And I told my mother that I had written, uh, that my, my first book had come out. And I told her that I had, she was one of the people I dedicated the book to. And her first response was, you didn't use my name, did you? I don't want people to know you're oh related Oh my goodness. To really? That's really? ouch. And Gosh. again, how oh. do I take it? Right versus figuring out that from my mother, she struggled with a lot of the stuff. She struggled with my sexuality. She struggled with my creativity at times. She struggled with my spirituality. And, she, you know, she has a different last name. And I didn't, I just said to mom, and she was oh, relieved okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. that I didn't use her name because when I actually tried to talk to her about it after I got through the ouchie, yeah. Which would be the first response. Yeah, that's yeah. it was, that was definitely a she yeah. was like, I wouldn't know how to explain that book. If my friends saw, I wouldn't know how to t I, I wouldn't I, I just I can't Right. No. It had no reality in her world. Mm. Right. Yeah, because if my mother had said something like that to me, I, I would have been like, I thought I told you, I won't tolerate a mean mother. How <laughs> dare you? Yeah. And my parents <laughs> my parents knew I was writing romance and that it was gonna be, you know Edgy. X rated. X rated. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, and it and it is. And it, it was it was actually became a running joke because as my father pointed out, I goes, Well, we did have to stop playing hair when you were four years old because you started singing the song. So <laughs> suppose we shouldn't be surprised. Huh. So Yeah. Well and again, you know, your your parents and again, you know, the 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 lovely thing is by the time I wrote the second poem, I was really clear about the fact of this is a reflection of her mm -hmm. and her time and her age yes. and her upbringing. And, you know, and, and I had a conversation with her at one point and said, you know, it really hurts that you're not proud of me. And she goes, what do you mean I'm not proud of you? I'm very proud of you. Yeah. But she felt like she had a responsibility to try to explain me. Yeah. I think my parents have given that up. Yeah. Well, I've given up trying to explain my kids. So. Well, <laughs> and that's just part and that's part of it. We, That's part of our, our growth from yep. you know, being parented one way to becoming parents or to becoming just adults, you know, and the type of adults that you know, I certainly bring my children to see and that they are connected to are ones who don't stop and think about their age or how they choose to be creative or, or any of those things. I think that part of it is, and, and it's, you know, you can, you can, you know, you see all those cute videos of like the animals that adopt another and a completely different kind yeah. of animal. Yeah. yeah. And it's just really cute and you look, oh my God, you know, there is a you know, there is a mother cat, you know, and it's feeding a lizard baby or something, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. And you think that's really great. And it is, but there's a time when they're both adults where maybe they won't kill each other or they might have, you know, been predators. But there's gonna be a point in adults where they're not going to be hanging around a lot together no. anymore because right. no. they have a different thing. And so one of the things is, and I say this actually as a salute, in a way a salute to mothers, um, and some insight for children who struggle with their mothers, because I've struggled for a lot of my life, and I don't, I don't have that struggle anymore. Mm -hmm. But is they get, you know, you don't have to explain them. They don't have to explain you once you become d adults. They get to go their way, you get to go your way, and you have to find the places where you cross. Mm -hmm. And it may yeah. only be, I gave my mother a choice once, early on when she said something that was very hurtful, the being mother thing. Yeah, yeah. And she didn't say it to be mean, but I said, do you only want that? And that was the reference to the poem. If you want, because you've already lost one child, I won't completely just, you know, like walk away, but, but I'll become a holiday child. I'll show yeah. up for the major holidays. I'll give you a kiss on the cheek. I won't tell you anything going on in my life. You'll be completely shut out. You'll have no idea who I am. Yeah. But then we won't fight. And she came back and she goes, no, <coughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Mm. Worth the fights. 
Yep, good, good. And that's an interesting thing when you can actually make that decision actively. Yeah, it would be worth it to, to fight with my child or for me to fight with a parent than to not have them around or to not have the, yeah. the whole relationship. My mother had a thing about wire hangers. She used to get Did intensely she? angry about wire hangers. She didn't like those? Hangers, you know? No. Yeah. Mommy dearest. <laughs> Ooh. Mommy dearest. <laughs> Mommy dearest. Ooh, that is a scary scene. Yes. So here is the here's a million dollar question. Wow. A million bucks. All right. Only Do we if have the get, budget for this. Only, only, only if you get it right. <laughs> oh. Oh gosh. It's a always point. a catch. And do I tell you before or after the question that there's no right answer? <laughs> I kind of figured that would be the catch. That's <laughs> something my mother would do. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, both your mothers supported some kind of creativity in you in some way, yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So, looking in this moment, mm -hmm. do you have the relationship with your mother you would like to have? No. I never see her. She's 1,500 miles away. Okay. Would you? Would she ever come out here? Do you ever get an opportunity to go out there? Is it not? I haven't. Uh, it's hard. It's hard for me to. Uh, I mean, I have gone out there to visit. When I was a kid, I'd go out every summer, hmm. and then as an adult, it got to be less and less often. And it's probably been ten years since last time I went out there. So you were not raised with your mother. No, uh, my parents split up when I was. I think I was six or seven. Okay. And my mother moved back to the Midwest a couple of years after the divorce. So then I would, I would the way the custody arrangement then worked is, because my dad won custody of me, which is kind of unusual, but. For the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not long ago. But uh, so then I would, uh, I would go out and spend the summers, summer okay. vacation with my mom in the Midwest. Okay, so that's also a very different relationship. Yeah. Do you think that, that relate, having a very non-traditional relationship with your mother ever fed any of your creativity? No, I've never seen any particular connection there. Okay. I think the psychiatrist asked me that, too. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. She didn't. <laughs> you, it was normal for you. I mean, if right. it started at six or seven, you know, this, this was normal. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Normal. Setting on a drug. And everybody remarried, and I just ended up with a bigger family. Yeah. yeah. And that became what worked for you. Yeah. Um, I have, I would say about 90% of the time I do. I have a very good relationship with my mother. She's in New Jersey in the house I grew up with, with the father I grew up with. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they have been married um, over 50 years. Um, it was 50 years in 2012, so. 55. Going, 55 years this year, yep. Um, and they were together seven years before that. My, um, they were, they were, High school, my mother, I think, was a high school freshman at 13, and wow. that's when she met my father. So no kidding. They've been there together their whole lives. Yeah, wow. Um, and both my parents have younger sisters, so um, they've also been in their lives their whole lives, which yeah. is kind of an interesting yeah. um, scenario. Um, Jersey is obviously not as far as Florida or the Midwest, but at the same time, it's, it's not next door. You know, when I have crazy days and could use an extra set of hands or someone else to drive, you know, to this day, it kind of bugs her a little bit that she's not there to help mm. um, and she does what she can. The other thing, though, that's been interesting for me recently, having to realize this, is um, I've been going through some of my own growth and revisiting aspects. This is going to sound like sitting on a shrink's couch and talking about my mother, but <laughs> revisiting some childhood injuries that really happened between, I would say, the ages of 12 and 14 and having to kind of look at how my parents reacted and didn't react and feeling angry again about that and my kids know we have I have a good relationship with them they have a good relationship with their grandparents and one day I said you know I have a very good relationship with your grandmother I said the person I'm mad at and the person I'm struggling with was 38 <laughs> when I was 14 right. <laughs> this is not the woman you know now this is a different person and I'm dealing with that who she was then not who she is now I've actually had mother friends of mine who know my mother um, from down there, she goes, she's the mother I never had. I'm like, I know, she's the mother I never had, too. Ah, 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 and yeah. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, what do you mean? This is a 70-something-year-old completed project I worked very hard on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the woman who raised me was 24 when I was born and on an army base because her husband had been drafted into oh, Vietnam. Wow. 
um, had never left New Jersey. Yeah. So this was a drastic change. I was born very ill. You know, this is not the woman you see here. This is you know, the woman who raised me was 24, 25. She was, yeah. she was much younger. Yeah. And much more, you know, had her fears and stuff like that. And it's different. Well, it's very interesting. My, my mother was 24 when I was born. Yeah. Mm. Mine was 19. And she's always said, and my dad says too, they just got married too young. That's why they didn't work out. No. You know, I mean, they got married for, uh, actually, it's funny, too, because my mother, I remember when I was a kid, my mother, on more than one occasion, telling me, reassuring me that I was not an accident, mm -hmm. you know, that, that I was planned, which made me then do the math to try to figure out, okay, is she telling me this because I actually was, because I didn't care. Right. It was so odd that she went out of her way to tell me that, that that, and that made me suspicious <laughs> <laughs> that, that maybe I really nothing. wasn't planned. But, and I never asked because I, cause my attitude was always, what's it matter? I'm here now. Even, right. when, even when I was a kid, I, like I, that's what I thought. It never mattered to me. But she went out of her way to tell me that I was planned, which makes, has always made me suspect that I actually was not planned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it is an interesting thing to go back or to meet somebody occasionally who's 36, 37 and realize, oh, my God, this is how old my mother was when I was an early teen. Right. And it's very different from... Because you don't go back and picture her that way. You kind of, she kind of looks like she does now, but even in my memories, you know, no matter how far back I go. I, know, just, what, I know what you mean. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, I get that. And so to have to stop and go, wait, no, we've both grown and changed, and right. we've both made other decisions, and we both learned and, you know, are better at communicating and not taking things personally and not trying to hide fears and things like that and living them and expressing them instead. Yeah, my... Um my mother did my oldest brother at 18, my middle brother at 21, and me at 24. Wow. So. 24, four years after they got married, and my brother three years later. My father, I mean, to realize my father was not quite 26 when I was born is kind of yeah. Yeah. amazing when I think about where I was at 26. And yeah, and it was definitely, it, it was definitely a different time. Yeah. A yeah. very different time. And they each, you know, and they come with a thing. and. Oftentimes when I'm doing work with clients and they're trying to heal wounds from the childhood, I, I have to snap them into a snapshot of, I know that's who the four-year-olds are or the six-year-olds are, or the, you know, yeah. but let's stop and see who were they really at that point? What pieces of the puzzle can we oh, put yeah. together? Because that makes such a difference of going... You know, when, when you reach the age where you were older than when your mother had you and mm -hmm. like what was, you know, what was happening and what was going on and, you know, all of those different, all of those different things and then put it in because that child that is unresolved never stops seeing the parent that was mean or abandon them or were you know was absent or whatever there was there's always mm -hmm. that yeah and then you become an adult blaming a child not not you know the child that your parent was because they were probably pretty young and if you i mean as i said if i think about where i was at 24 you know the thought of being married for four years already and having a newborn i couldn't have done it yep yep and i stop and think that you know um by the time, uh, you know, by the time my mother was like 32, she was just about 31, 32 years old, she was on her third marriage, which has been now 50 years. I mean, it's all yeah, yeah. years. You know, it was <laughs> third time was a charm, yeah. <laughs> but, you know. My mom's on her fourth. Yes. Yeah. Is that we, one just right? Not too hot, not too cold. They have been, they have been together yeah. a long time, so it looks like it, looks like it. yeah. Yeah, this one sticks. Yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I had definitely had some playouts with, with my own stepfather. I mean, we had a very rocky childhood together. Luckily, <laughs> I outgrew my childhood. He stayed. Um, oh, but, yeah. uh, you know, in his childhood, not mine. Got right. it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's... You look at it all and, and you go back and you have to really put the kind of pieces of like, yeah, how old were they and what were they going mm -hmm. through and yeah. where were you and, and what was the factor and you saw it as a child. If you actually saw that same interaction between a child and an adult and you were the adult and it wasn't you, you might express it very differently. Yeah.
And that's, that's an, it's, and again, I think that goes back to why you don't change certain things you create because it does give you that, that re-anchoring, that remembrance, that time capsule. Yep. Of, mm. This is who I was, this is where I was, this is how I perceived this person. And, and the ability to kind of go back and say, wow, that's changed. Yeah. Okay, well, we're wrapping up dragons and unicorns and other creative and other creatures. And other creative creatures. And other creative <laughs> creatures. We had creative creature Matt Connerton on, who is now on Drive Time. Yeah, WMNH 95.3 in Manchester, weekdays, 4 to 6 p.m. Oof, what time FM. does your Drive Time start? 4 to well, 6. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 4 to 6 Drive Time. <laughs> so, we want to wish all the mothers out there yeah. happy Mother's Day. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed this Mother's Day version of Dragons, Unicorns, and Other Creative Creatures. Uh, and, you know, remember, your mother today was not your mother yesterday, and if you're a mother, you won't be the mother tomorrow you were yesterday either. Hopefully. Namaste. Mm -hmm.